Good morning, Shepherd of the Hills. Morning. morning. It is wonderful to see you all here this morning. It is a beautiful day. It is a blessed day to be here for worship. I want to especially welcome those of you who are new or visiting this morning, or welcome those of you who are online this morning. It is a great day to be together to worship. We've got a wonderful morning in store for you. We're going to explore my favorite passages from Scripture, and at the same time, we're going to sing some beautiful songs. So, I do have one big announcement this morning. Next week, what we are going to do is we are going to do outdoor worship. So, right over in that nice big grassy pavilion, as we have a tradition of doing here, we are going to ask you to bring your own lawn chairs, camp chairs, whatever have you, and we are going to spread out on there. And it'll be a chance for us to worship together out of our cars. Now, for those of you, and I actually just heard from a few people this morning how much you guys enjoy being in your cars, just for maintaining that, you know, social distancing, that is totally fine. What we are going to do is we are going to mark out a bunch of spaces over that way, so you're close and you can see and you can still listen on your radio. It is a chance for everybody to gather and to worship, and it's just going to be fun. Now, for those of you joining online, we are going to keep up that online presence. And the church council has an email for you, which has more details on stuff coming up and uh, for everything else happening. So look for that in your email. So next Sunday, 9.30 a.m., same bat time, but different bat channel will be on the grass. I don't know about you. I'm really excited about that. Now, since this is Wisconsin, I do want to give you the warning. If we get in climate weather, now, the forecast is a week from now. Who knows what the forecast is going to hold. But if we do get any climate weather, we will go to online only. So that is the plan for right now. But hopefully, keep praying for good weather, a hole in the rain. As long as there's not lightning and torrential rain, and we can do this outside. I'm excited. We're going to keep moving forward. We are going to keep changing, and we're going to keep working to bring you the rest of the worship experience we can do. And uh, it's going to be a great day next week. So thank you all for your patience and your prayers in this time. It has been great to be outside and to worship with you guys. And I'm looking forward to being having everybody outside, not just me. So next Sunday, bring your own camp chair and the bathrooms will be open. So, all right. So we are going to begin with the announcement of confession and forgiveness. If you have your bulletin, if you printed that with you, if you printed that and brought that with you, that is great. If you didn't, it's on the website, shepherd-fills.org, and it's right at the top there. Or it's also in the old church email, I believe. I didn't check that this morning, but I'm pretty sure. So you just go ahead and follow along with me. Let us confess our sins together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a few moments just to reflect on ourselves and our need for a Savior. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now hear these words. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power in the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. And together we all say, Amen. I love you guys. All right, let's continue with our opening song, Here I Am to Worship. world you 
to Jonah, son of Amatai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. 
The sea was getting rougher and rougher. <clears throat> so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men grew greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Here ends the reading. So my wife asked me this week, what are you preaching on? And I said, Jonah. In fact, we're starting a new four-part series on Jonah. And she had the same reaction that I'm sure a lot of you had, which was, really? Why? And I said, because I think that there's a lot to learn for this in today's world. I think there's a lot of stuff that really applies to the current situation that we're in. She kind of gave me this look like, are you sure? And yeah, yeah, yeah. There is this fascinating question in this story, this part of the story that Mary Jo just read for us. You see, this story of Jonah, 2,700 years ago is when it happened, 700 years before Jesus. God says to Jonah, this prophet, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach against that great city. Tell them to repent. Tell them that they have been evil. They have done awful things. And they need to change who they are. And Jonah doesn't even respond to God. At least not verbally. He goes the other way. He says, God wants me to go there. I'm going that way. See, what happened was, the people of Israel hated the Ninevites, hated the people of Nineveh. Nineveh was the center of this empire in what today is modern-day Iraq. It was this nation-state which would come in and invade Israel and burn everything to the ground, and everything that they didn't burn, they carried off. Anything of value, any crops, any livestock, any women, they would just say, you know what? It's ours. We're going to take it. And so the people of Israel hated Nineveh. Hated, hated, hated. So when God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, he says, I'm taking a boat to Tarshish. Now, we don't know exactly where Tarshish is, but we're pretty sure it's in Spain. So when God says, I want you to go to modern-day Iraq and Jonah's saying, I'm going to go to Spain. It's a bit like God telling you, I need you to go to New Jersey. And you saying, yeah, I'm booking a flight to San Diego. This is not exactly obedience to God. But this raises the question that I think applies to us so well today. Who is it that God loves that you hate? This is at the core of what's going on for Jonah. Jonah hates the people of Nineveh. And not without reason. And God's saying, yeah, I want them to be saved. I want them to get through this. I want them to find redemption. I want them to be better. And this is a tough thing for us to wrap our heads around. And if I ask you, who do you hate? And you think of it in a geopolitical thing. 
And you go, well, we're not really fond of the Chinese right now. But if I asked you, do you want all of China to go to hell? You'd be like, well, I'm kind of upset over what they're doing to Hong Kong, and I'm not really fa happy about the fact they covered up this virus, which is going to kill hundreds of thousands of people. But I don't really want them to go to hell. That's usually the reaction we have when we think about this kind of a story. It doesn't hit us in that same visceral way when God asked Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh. Now, what happens if I ask you about that car? You know that car that you pull up behind, behind at the stop sign, and it's got all the bumper stickers. Am I still on? Still good? Oh, okay. All the bumper stickers, all the ones that support the things that you hate, and all the bumper stickers that say people like you are dumb. Or maybe there's just one sticker, and it's for that particular candidate that hates people like you, and who you feel like is out to destroy everything that you stand for, and everything that you love in your community. And you feel that bit of rage just rising up in your gut. Admit it. Feel like you want them to go to hell. See, we've fallen into this place in the world, in America, these days, and we were having this issue even pre-coronavirus, where the mediating institutions of our nation, of our society, have fallen out. 20, 30, 50 years ago, there was much more of that mixing in society, where you had these places like the Rotary, the Kiwanis, the Lions Club, even churches, even congregations, where you would have different people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different places on the socioeconomic spectrum, mixing. You'd have the president of the local bank and the high school janitor sitting next to each other at functions. You'd have different kids of, of different political identities sitting on the same softball team. But now we've done this sort where different communities have different political ideologies. And the problem is, as we've done that, we've gone from I'm right and you're wrong and we'll argue about who's right, to I'm right and you're evil. And create this environment where there's no common ground. And that was even before we all ended up in lockdown for the last 317 months. Making this pressure cooker of a situation where we don't actually talk to other people and we just view them as other and this other tribe and we're angry at them and we do, like Jonah, want them to go to hell. That's why I find this book so amazing. Because human nature doesn't change. Jonah makes this argument 2,700 years ago that he doesn't care if God loves these people. He doesn't. And he's okay with that. And on some level, that stirs something within us. See, Jesus gets asked this question, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then they ask Jesus this natural follow-up question. Well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus lays out the story of the Good Samaritan. And again, that story loses its context for us because we lose the cultural associations. But this idea that a Samaritan would help a Jew after, and, and save somebody who was beaten and left for dead, it's a scandal. It is more other than you can imagine in our world today. Even with all our divisions, even with all the stuff that we have going on, and all these people who are making money off of your outrage and furthering divisions in this society, it is still more than we can imagine. 
this is where the story gets interesting. And what I want to suggest for you is this is a short book. It is only four chapters long. You can sit down with your family and read it out loud in 25 minutes. And I would suggest you do that today because it is so much fun. Because what happens is, is Jonah has basically said, not out loud, but with every bit of his actions, that he doesn't care what happens to the people of Nineveh. And he gets on this boat and he sails from Spain. And God's like, are we really going to do this? You're going to make me do this? And so he sends up this big storm. And long story short, the sailors realize it's Jonah's fault. And Jonah says, yeah, you got to throw me overboard. That'll make the storm stop. And the sailors are like, are you sure there's not another option? Because we're really not cool with murder. I mean, you got to respect these guys. This is one of the funny things about this story. Jonah, supposedly the hero of the story, the prophet, the man of God, is the idiot at the center of everything, and the pagans are the ones who come out looking good throughout the whole thing. So these pagan sailors, who are all praying to their own gods, are the ones trying to save Jonah's miserable hide, and they keep trying to row back to shore, and they throw all the cargo overboard, and they do everything that they can. And finally they're just like, we, we can't. And they say to God, you know, we're sorry, but we don't think we have an option. So they throw Jonah over the side. And the storm goes quiet. Can you imagine being these guys? You've got this guy who's a prophet. A guy who claims to speak for the God that created the heavens and the earth. And you throw him overboard and the sea goes quiet from the midst of this giant storm. I'd be freaked out. And so were they. They made sacrifices and worshipped the one true God. Which leads me to my last point today. You are a witness. You might very well be the only reflection of God that somebody ever knows. The way the story is written, just the way the language is used, these sailors probably had not met, or at least were not familiar with believers in the God of Israel. And so for them to meet Jonah and have this experience was profound and life-changing. And I suspect that some of you could look back at people you've met in the past and say, this is how these people have changed my faith for better, for worse. When I went through my wandering agnostic phase back when I was in college, because you know how it is when you're in college and you think you're so much smarter than everybody you went before? Yeah, that was me. I'll just own it. But I remember meeting Christians, meeting believers, and it seemed like there was always this group that tried to talk me into going to following Jesus through judgment and hellfire and brimstone. And it was always this, you know you're going to go to hell for this. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of rejecting the whole concept here, so that's not really a threat. And it was just this constant threat of hellfire and damnation. And it's like, did not register for my 19 year old little tiny brain. But at the same time, I was meeting these other Christians that had peace, had purpose. And I looked at them and I'm like, I want that. I want that peace. And I want that purpose. Because I did not have it at the time. And they could have talked to me about hellfire and damnation because frankly I deserved it. Because who doesn't at age 19? But the love and that reflection of Jesus they gave me was something amazing and that's why I'm standing up here now. And I want you to think about this. We are living in this world that is increasingly tribal. 
It is increasingly angry. And I know we are all under massive stress. And I know we are all trying to figure out how to manage all the risks and everything else. And it is so easy to snap. But I want to ask you to love the people who are unlovable. To love the people who you disagree with. You are going to have interactions with people who are downright rude, who are downright uncivil. It is just the nature of our world today. And I want you to understand that your reactions are a reflection of your love, excuse me, of God's love for you. Remember that passage from Romans. Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. And it is the kindness of God that leads to our repentance. So when those people that you run into, those people that you know, those people that just make you so angry, reflect God to them with love, with kindness, with humility. And we're going to move forward through the story over the next three weeks. We're going to explore Jonah's journey and what happens next. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for your grace. We pray you would help us to reflect you, reflect your love to the people around us, the people who are unlovable, the people who we hate. And we pray that you would be glorified in everything that we do. Amen. Oh, we're going to sing our sermon in that. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know. My strength is in your name, for you alone can say, you will deliver me, yours is the victory, whom shall I fear, whom shall
is by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side always by my side. Good morning. My name is Ryan Richmond. I normally attend the uh, 1030 service. And uh, I got to admit, this is really cool. I, I, this is fantastic. Um, everybody get together and worship it in our own style. You know, give me yourself a little tune. Tune to the horn. <laughs> Woo! All right, great. <laughs> Let us celebrate our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. I'm Don Creefall, and my wife Sandy and I attend the 1030 service. Let us pray. Lord, we know that no matter how bad it seems, no situation is out of your control. We know that even in times of pandemic, civil unrest, and racial tension, you are the solution. You provide for all our needs. You soothe all our hurts and fears. With you, we are strong. Without you, we are nothing more than fighting children. Lord, let us look to you to provide a safe haven in the eye of the storm. Lord, let us look to your word to learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, you know our needs before we even know them ourselves. You are aware of all that concerns us, and you have a plan. You alone can move mountains to make a way for your children. We faithfully wait for your answer in your timing as part of your plan to be given for every concern that weighs heavily upon our hearts. Grant us the courage to say, Lord, here I am, and the fortitude to not run away, but to faithfully work to accomplish what you ask of us. Forgive us for doubting you, for worrying, for trying so hard to work everything out on our own. Help us to trust you more and overcome our unbelief. Help us to love you as you love us. Help us to learn to forgive as you forgive us. Help us to remember that we are all your children Brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter how we look, where we live, and who we are, we choose to believe that you are able to accomplish far more than we ever thought possible. We lift up in prayer those in our church family in need of healing. Diana, Mary, Gail, Mike, Trisha, Mary Ellen, Deb, and for the family Dorothy Strutz Walter, a former member of Shepherd of the Hills, who passed away on June 6th. Lord, thank you in advance for your miracles, known and unknown, and for loving us even when we doubt you. Thank you for the abundance of blessings and goodness that you have in store for us. We trust you this day and every day, and are so grateful for the gift of salvation that you so graciously bestow upon us. Lord, let us be content in all circumstances. Open our hearts to better love you and help us learn to lean on you and not ourselves. We ask all this in your holy name as we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Don. Uh, before we do the benediction, there's just this I want to mention. I want to thank everybody here who helped with this service. The people who do the setup and the tech and the singing. It has been amazing. And I want to particularly thank everybody who has led the prayers over the past, I don't know, six or eight weeks since whenever we switched to this. The people leading the prayers have been the ones writing the prayers. I don't write those. Those have just been amazing. And I have loved every bit of that. It's just been so heartfelt. Now, a couple last things. Again, we're going to do outdoor worship next week, 930, right over there. If you want to stay in your car, we are going to have spots where you can stay in your car and still listen and still be part of things and still maintain whatever level of distance you feel comfortable with. Again, check your email, check all the usual channels to make sure you get all the updates from the council. Lots of news coming out. Worship does not end. It changes form. We go into this world, we worship with our relationships, with our interactions, with our work, until we come together again to worship as a body. And so as you go, take this benediction with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you. May He look upon you if ever grant you His peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
person and those of you joining us online, it is a blessing to have you here in worship and we hope you were blessed to be here today in whatever manner you were able to worship with us. And so, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once again, please, yeah, there we go, we can do it again now. <laughs> and once again, our parking attendants will direct you out and they will have offering baskets if you'd like to give in a physical fashion. Otherwise, we always are able to give online, which is always such a blessing for us. Thank you again. We will see you next week, 9.30, here in person or online. Amen.